The Sermon on Temptation by St. Francis de Sales. My son, when you come to serve God, prepare your soul for temptation. See Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, chapter 2, verse 1. This is an admonition of the sage. My son, if you intend to serve God, prepare your soul for some temptation. For it is an infallible truth that no one is exempt from temptation when he has truly resolved to serve God. This being the case, our Lord himself chose to be subjected to temptation in order to show us how we ought to resist it. Thus the evangelists tell us, He was led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted. I shall draw lessons from this mystery for our particular instruction, in as familiar manner as I am able. In the first place, I note that although no one can be exempt from temptation, Still no one should seek it or go of his own accord to the place where it may be found, for undoubtedly he who loves it will perish in it. That is why the evangelist says that our Lord was led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted. It was not then by his choice, I am speaking with regard to his human nature, that he went to the place of temptation, but he was led by the obedience he owed to his heavenly Father. I find in Holy Scripture two young princes who furnish us with examples on this subject. One sought temptation and perished in it. The other, without seeking it, encountered it, but left the combat victorious. At the time when king should go to war as his own army faced the enemy, David strolled about on the roof of the king's house, idling his time away as though he had nothing to do. Being idle in this way, he was overcome by temptation. Bethsabee, the that inconsiderate lady, went to bathe in a place where she could be seen from the roof of the king's house. Certainly this was an act of unparalleled imprudence, which I cannot excuse, even though several modern writers wish to render it excusable by saying that she did not think of that. To bl- bathe in a place where she exposed herself to view from the roof of the royal palace was a very great indiscretion. Whether she thought of it or not, young Prince David began by allowing himself to gaze on her, and then perished in the temptation which he had sought by his idleness and sloth. You see, idleness is a great help to temptation. Never say, I do not seek it, I am not doing anything. That is enough in order to be tempted, for temptation has a tremendous power over us when it finds us idle. Oh, if David had gone out on campaign at the time, he shouldn't have gone. The temptation would not have had the power of attacking him, or at least of overcoming and vanquishing him. In contrast, young Prince Joseph, who was later viceroy of Egypt, did not seek temptation at all, and so upon meeting it, he did not perish in it. He had been sold by his brothers, and his master's wife exposed him to danger, but he had never indulged or heeded the amorous glances of his mistress. Rather, he nobly resisted her advances and was victorious, thus triumphing not only over the temptation, but also over her who had been the cause of it. If we are led by the Spirit of God to the place of temptation, we should not fear, but we should be assured that he will render us victorious. But we must not seek temptation, nor go out to allure it, however holy and generous we may think ourselves to be, for we are not more valiant than David." nor than our divine master himself, who did not choose to seek it. Our enemy is like a chained dog. If we do not approach it, it will do us no harm, even though it tries to frighten us by barking at us. But wait a little, I pray you, and see how certain it is that no one who comes to serve God can avoid temptations. We could give many examples of this, but one or two will suffice. Ananias and Sapphira made a vow to dedicate themselves and their possessions to the perfection which all the first Christians professed, submitting themselves to obedience to the apostles. They had no sooner made their resolution than temptation attacked them, as St. Peter said, who has tempted you to lie to the Holy Spirit. The great apostle St. Paul, as soon as he had given himself to the divine service and ranged himself on the side of Christianity, was immediately tempted for the rest of his life. While he was an enemy of God and persecuted the Christians, he did not feel the attack of any temptation, or at least he has given us no testimony of it in his writings, but he did when he was converted by our Lord. Thus it is very necessary practice to prepare our souls for temptation. That is, wherever we may be and however perfect we may be, we we must rest assured that temptation will attack us. 
Hence, we ought to be so disposed and provide ourselves with the weapons necessary to fight valiantly in order to carry off the victory, since the crown is only for the combatants and conquerors. We ought never to trust in our own strength or in our own courage and go out and seek temptation, thinking to confound it. But if in that place where the Spirit of God has led us we encounter it, we must remain firm in the confidence which we ought to have that he will strengthen us against the attacks of our enemy, however furious they may be. Let us proceed and consider a little the weapons which our Lord made use of to repulse the devil that came to tempt him in the desert. They were none other than, my dear friends, than those of the psalmist speaks of in the psalm we recite every day at Compline. Qui habitat in adjuratorio alestimi, who dwells in the aid of the Most High. From this psalm we learn an admirable doctrine. He speaks in this manner as though addressing Christians or someone in particular. Oh, how happy you are, you who are armed with the truth of God, for it will serve you as a shield against the arrows of your enemies, and will make you victorious. Therefore do not fear, O blessed souls, you who are armed with this armor of truth, Fear neither the terrors of the night, for you will not stumble into them, nor the arrows that fly in the air by day, for arrows will not be able to injure you, nor the business that roams in the night, much less the devil that advances and reveals himself at noon. Oh, how divinely well armed with truth was our Lord and Master, for he was the truth itself. This truth of which the psalmist speaks is nothing other than faith. Whoever is armed with faith, fear nothing. This is the only armor necessary to repel and confound our enemy. For what can harm him who says, as the credo says, I believe in God, who is our Father, and our Father Almighty? In saying these words, we show that we do not trust in our own strength, and that it is only in the strength of God, the Father Almighty, that we undertake the combat, that we hope for victory. No, let us not go on our own to meet temptation by any presumption of spirit, but only rebuff it when God permits it to attack us, and seek us out where we are, as it did our Lord in the desert. By using the words of Holy Scripture, our dear Master overcame all the temptations the enemy presented to him. But I want it to be understood that the Savior was not tempted as we are, and that temptation could not be in him as it is in us, for he was an, an impregnable stronghold to which it did not have any access. Just as a man who is vested from head to foot in fine steel could not be injured in any way by the blows of a weapon, since it would glance off on either side, not even scratching the armor, so temptation could indeed encompass our Lord but never enter into him, nor do any injury to his integrity and perfect, perfect purity. But we are different. If by the grace of God we do not consent to temptations and avoid the fault and the sin in them, Ordinarily, we are nevertheless wounded a little by some importunity, trouble, or emotion that they produce in our heart. Our divine master could not have faith, since he possessed in the superior part of his soul. From the moment he began to be a perfect knowledge of the truths which faith teaches us. However, he wished to make use of this virtue in order to repeal or repel the enemy, for no other reason, my dear friends, than to teach all that we have to do. Do not then seek for others' arms nor other weapons in order to refu refuse consent to a temptation, except to say, I believe. And what do you believe? In God, my Father Almighty. St. Bernard, referring to these words of the psalm which we have cited, said that the terrors of the night of which the psalmist speaks are of three kinds. From this I will draw my third lesson. The first fear is that of cowards and slothful souls. The second, that of children. And the third, of the weak. Fear is the first temptation which the enemy presents to those who have resolved to serve God. For as soon as they are shown what perfect, perfection requires of them, they think, Alas, I shall never be able to do it. It seems to them that it is almost an impossibility to attain to that height. And they readily say, O oh God, what perfection is needed to live in this house, or in this way of life and in my vocation. It is too high for me. I cannot attain it. Do not trouble yourself, and do not frame these idle fears that you are not able to accomplish that to which you have bound yourself, since you are armed and encompassed with the truth of God and his word. Having called you to this manner of life and to this house, he will strengthen you, and will give you the grace to persevere, and to do what is required for his greater glory, and for your greater welfare and happiness, provided you walk simply in faithful observance. Do not be astonished, therefore, do not do as the slothful who are troubled when they wake at night by the fear that daylight will come very soon when they will have to work. 
The slothful and the cowardly fear everything and find everything difficult and trying because they amuse themselves in thinking with the foolish and slothful imagination which they have created for themselves, more about future difficulties than what they have to do at present. Oh, they say, if I devote myself to the service of God, it will be necessary for me to work so much in order to resist the temptations which will attack me. You are quite right, for you will not be exempt from them, since it is a general rule that all the servants of God are tempted. As St. Jerome wrote in that beautiful epistle which he addressed to his dear daughter, Eustochium, To whom do you wish, I pray, that the devil should present his temptations, if not to those who despise them? Sinners tempt themselves. The devil already regards them as his own. They are his confederates because they do not reject his suggestions. On the contrary, they seek them, and temptation resides in them. The devil does not work much to set his snare for in the secular world, but rather in retired places, where he expects a great gain in bringing about the downfall of souls, who are secluded there serving the divine majesty more perfectly. St. Thomas used to marvel greatly at how the greatest sinners went into the streets, laughing and joyful, as though their sins did not weigh on their consciences. And who would not be astonished at seeing a soul not in God's grace making merry? Oh, how vain are their joys, and how false their gaiety, for they have gone after anguish and internal regrets. Let us leave them, I pray you, and return to the fear of the slothful. They are always lamenting. And why? Why, you ask? Alas, we must work, and yet I thought that it would be enough to embark on God's way and in his service to find rest. But do you not know that the slothful and idleness made poor David perish in temptation? You perhaps would wish to be among those garrison soldiers who have everything they wish in a good town. They are merry, they are the masters of their host's home. They sleep in his bed and live well. Nevertheless, they are called soldiers, feigning to be valiant and courageous, while they go neither to battle nor to war. But our Lord does not want this kind of warrior in his army. He wants combatants and conquerors, not sluggards and cowards. He chose to be tempted, and himself attacked in order to give us an example. The second terror of the night, according to St. Bernard, is that experienced by children. As you are aware, children are very much afraid when they are out of their mother's arms. If they see a barking dog, they suddenly begin to cry, and will not stop until they are again with their mama. In her arms they feel secure. They feel that nothing can harm them provided they are holding her hand. Ah, then, the psalmist says, why do you fear, you who are encompassed with truth and armed with strong shield of faith, which teaches you that God is your Father Almighty? Hold his hand and do not be frightened, for he will save you and protect you against all your enemies. Consider how St. Peter, after he made that generous act of throwing himself into the sea, and began walking on water in order more quickly to reach our divine Savior, who had called to him, suddenly began to fear and at the same time to sink down and cried out, Lord, save me. And at once his good master stretched out his hand and took hold of him, thus saving him from drowning. Let us do the same, my dear friends. If we feel that we lack courage, let us cry out in a loud voice full of confidence, Lord, save me. Let us not doubt that God will strengthen us and prevent us from perishing.